You can get us kicked off, Rebecca. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, I'm filling in for Liz. My name is Rebecca Dandidia, and I uh, work in the American Indian Initiatives Department with uh, Rebecca Hammond, who is also here uh, co-hosting and co-moderating. So thank you all for joining tonight um, uh, for our uh, presentation with uh, Felicity Amaya Schaefer. So before um, we get kicked off, um, I would like to present our land acknowledgement. Um, the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits. Uh, Crow Canyon is grateful to all Indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Further, we acknowledge that reconciliation is a powerful and necessary step for justice and equity in our work, and we are committed to this process in our Crow Canyon relationships. And thank you all so much for your continued support um, of Crow Canyon. We really, really couldn't do it without your support. Okay, so just quickly, um, we are presenting this uh, via Zoom. Um, and so if you have any questions, um, put them in the little Q&A chat box. Um, if you put it in the chat box, your questions might um, sort of be, uh, like we might not see them. So make sure if there are questions um, specific to the presentation, the Q&A is the, the tab that you wanna click on. Um, and if you're having um, any more difficulties, we are also streaming this um, on our Facebook page. And um, you can also subscribe to us on our YouTube channel to um, see our past videos. Okay, um, we have uh, some, uh, a couple of great webinars coming up uh, next week and the following. Um, uh, next week, we have Dr. Michael Smith uh, presenting on Aztec archeological sites in Mexico. And the week following is a Four Corners lecture series. Um, with doctors uh, Derek and Michelle Turner, uh, Leaving Traces, Fairy Houses, Kindness Stones, and Constructed Heritage on April, April 4th. Okay, and so this webinar series really um, is dependent on your support and your donations, and we're so grateful that uh, we're able to bring people from all over the country to, um, to, to, be part of this series. Um, so thank you all so, so much. All right, and so uh, in September, this is a little plug for an upcoming program we have coming up for a couple different weeks in September. Um, our ARP or Archaeology Research Program uh, theme this year is Human Environment Relationships. Um, and so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, but it's a really great opportunity to join um, uh, folks and interested uh, researchers um, from all sorts of backgrounds to uh, engage with the work we have going on here at Crow Canyon. Um, we will be working with uh, staff and scholars um, to, to discuss uh, indigenous and Western science approaches in archeology. span um, and so the two weeks uh, it's going on are listed here, September 8th through 14th and 20th, 22nd through the 28th. Um, and you can get more information on our website. Okay, so uh, to introduce our presenter tonight, uh, Felicity Amaya Schaefer is a chair of the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Department, as well as the Peggy and Jack Baskin Endowed Chair of the Feminist Studies Department and Chair of the Critical Race and Ethnic Studies Department. Her research and teaching interests include Latinx and Indigenous de Decolonial Studies, Migration and Border Studies, uh, and Feminist and criti Critical Race Science and Technology Studies. Her first book, Love and Empire, Cyber Marriage and Citizenship Across the Americas, follows internet-mediated marriages across the US, Colombia, and Mexico, alongside neo-colonial fantasies of racial and gender differences across borders. Her second book, Unsettled Borders, the Militarized Surveillance on Sacred Indigenous Land, 
remaps the virtual border war alongside the ongoing settler colonial war with indigenous peoples. Um, she was also one of the editors of the anthology titled Precarity and Belonging, Labor, Migration and Non-Citizenship, and has published articles in a variety of international journals in Mexico, France and Brazil. Uh, in December of 2022, she participated in a UN expert seminar participant, uh, as a UN expert seminar participant on the impact of militarization on the rights of indigenous peoples um, in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and yeah, just also really look up to you as a grad student as well. So thank you so much for joining. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you tonight. Um, so let me see, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Um, let's see. So then I will share mine. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Is that is that good? Can you see my screen? We can see it. We're cutting off a little bit. Will you zoom out? Just let, there we go. That's perfect. Okay. That looks good. Yep, that looks great. Okay, and then that's all you see, right? Is my screen? <laughs> yep, all I'm seeing is your PowerPoint. You're looking okay. great. All right, well, thank you, Rebecca, for that um, really warm introduction. And thank you, Taylor, for inviting me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here to share my research with you all and um, really honored to be in conversation today. Um, and because I'm also going to be talking about sacred land, I wanted to also take a moment to acknowledge that where I live here um, at Santa Cruz, California, I'm um, here at UC Santa Cruz. This is the land of the Awaswas, Upi speaking tribe that is also being stewarded today by the Amit Mutsun tribal band, who we really um, work closely with at UC Santa Cruz as we try to figure out you know, these questions about what does it mean for the university to be on this land and for all of us to be here as well. Um, and I think it's also important before I get into the research to say that my own grandparents, um, you know, on my mother's side, were displaced from their land um, in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution and were forced to migrate um, from Mexico to the US into Texas. So they left a very small town called Bustamante, um, which is southwest of Texas. Um, that was that is still the ancestral land of the Navajo Apache or the Diné. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about um, really, well, two chapters, but trying to really just focus on one from my book, Unsettled Borders. Um, and it's interesting to say that this actually wasn't the book that I thought I was going to be writing. Um, I started this project with what I thought was a simple question, which ended up being um, taking me on a very long and interesting journey. But my question was, you know, how is it that the U.S.-Mexico border has really evolved into such a heavily militarized zone? This sort of everyday war that has become increasingly automated or virtualized and routinized in ways that um, I think kind of uh, erase the brutal everyday violence that leads to rape, trauma, and death um, against migrants. And let's see, so I can then move my screen. Let's see, sorry, let me just figure out how to make that work. Okay, so now you can see the next slide. Okay. Um, so what I found in researching the book uh, led me to question so many um, ways that we had really thought about the border in migration and border studies, especially when the focus has been so much on migrants crossing the border. But what I found um, we had missed was this um, presence of Native Americans still living um, across the borderlands today. And this was a really surprising erasure, given that Native tribes still live on 40% of the border today. 
So you can see all the different tribes along the borderlands. There's 26 federally recognized tribes and over 13 or more unrecognized groups um, along the border. Okay. Um, see, sorry. So I'm trying to keep, yeah. Okay. So um, as, oops. Sorry, this is a little bit clunky. Um, as I, you know, as I started thinking about this question, I had to sort of consider, you know, one, how am I going to research this? And I had to question myself, you know, is this my story to tell? So as I was, you know, getting into the research, I, one evening, I was um, introduced to several members of the Tahona Otham Reservation, who I had invited to my home um, for dinner. And I told them my ideas about the book. And we had a long discussion from their perspective about what the border was like for them. And um, after the evening sort of came to a close, they asked me um, whether I would come and visit their reservation so that I could speak to people and really see what it was like for them living on the border. And I realized that um, this was not just a, a, an invitation, but really um, a responsibility to tell um, this story from their perspective. So this became um, the second chapter of the book where, as you can see, for them, um, they really saw the border as this project of genocide and as an occupation on their sacred land. And um, it's really important to know that they don't even have the word border in their language, but at the same time, they experience the border as sort of a verb, as being bordered or being contained or under occupation by the hundreds of border patrol officials who are, you know, sort of chasing migrants and working all across their land. They're not just at the border. There's huge infrastructural development, um, detention center that's built there on their land, checkpoints, um, miles from the border. There's a vehicle border barrier um, on the border. And more recently in the last year or so, um, nine surveillance towers were also built. And of course, drones and helicopters um, above. So being on their land, you know, on their ancestral homeland really felt like a militarized zone. And one of the challenges is that because border officials and surveillance cameras can't tell the difference between Otham and migrants or drug traffickers, they're constantly under suspicion as being migrants, which is also being seen as a criminal, and constantly stopped at checkpoints or by border patrol, again, anywhere on their land. And so because of this problem, they were told that they need to show documents to prove that they're US citizens, which they're strongly against because they are continuing to fight for their um, right to be sovereign members of their own tribal nation, not members of the US nation. So they describe borders as genocide because it's become impossible for them to continue their everyday practices of movement across their land, which includes crossing this quote unquote border. And that this movement across their land is integral to preserving their ways of being awesome. So for example, um, you know, traditional hunting is being disturbed by the bright lights from surveillance and the Department of Homeland Security um, lights, there's loud noises um, so that the animals are um, being scared and they're not moving in their usual patterns. Um, they're being stopped when they visit family on the Mexican side or when they have ceremony, you know, across community members 
across the border. They're stopped when they're moving south in the direction of their sacred pilgrimage and, um, you know, treated as criminals for helping migrants, whether, you know, giving them water or food or even a ride. So for them, um, borders stop life, right? It stops their sacred footprints from uh, moving across the land that enacts these sacred relations and knowledges with land that they describe as um, a genocidal project against them as a people. So part of um, what I wanted to do in the book was to uh, follow the surveillance technologies that were being used to militarize the, the border today and as you'll see, to think about how these technologies um, actually are based on this long tradition and intelligence um, that Native peoples have had with land that I call a sacred science, or you know, this deep ancestral knowledge that continues to orient their movement, their everyday rhythms to living, that's based on knowledge of stars, seasons, animals, and plants. You know, this incredible uh, worldview that's in threat of being massacred through militarized bordering of them and the land. And I think at this particular moment, it was important for me to see their knowledge as, um, you know, sacred science, all one word, be, um, in a way to refuse the separation between the sacred and science and to really show how deep this knowledge is and that it is an, an entire scientific worldview at a time when I think indigenous peoples are still being called primitive, still being seen as anti-scientific when they oppose, for example, observatory towers being built. Um, in Hawaii and other of their sacred mountains. Um, okay. And so in thinking about the ways that they are discussing um, this, the border as an act of genocide, um, one of the ways to understand this is to um, consider the ways in which um, the actual building of the wall that was built just outside of the borders of their um, land was a practice of bombing um, the land that led to the amputation of the ancient saguaros that they call Hasham, which is, they see them as ancestors or people. So the murdering of the saguaros are also akin to the murdering of them and the knowledges that are tied to, um, to these beings. And um, the saguaros to them are teachers, right? Who hold knowledge about how to survive in the desert. Um, this is another part of the book I don't have time to get into here, but they have different root systems that allow them to take water at different times of the year when the water tables um, sometimes are really shallow and sometimes necessitate roots that go really deep, right? So um, rather than thinking about this relationship as cultural, right? These knowledges as cultural, I think, again, thinking about their deep ancestral knowledges that have been passed down um, generation after generation um, that, and, you know, that there's so much involved in understanding a relationship, right? The study, the scientific study of a saguaro involves so much about a relationship um, that gets beyond Western science that really separates out the human and the non-human. Okay. Um, so I wanted to show this um, this map here and you know this was this image of the border this is the if you haven't seen it it's quite impressive to see the 30 foot border wall um this was during trump's presidency that 
was built. So here on the map, you can see right next to the image of the wall being put up, you can see the Tahana Otham Reservation. And then at Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, which was also part of their traditional land, is the place where these walls were being built in 2019. Um, the, there were walls there, but they've continued to build them. And you can see here on the map, Quito Baquito Springs, which is um, a sacred water source for many different um, travelers coming through for the Otham. Um, they actually, to build the wall, not only did they bomb a lot of their sacred sites, their burial grounds, but also siphoned out water from this sacred water source, which you can imagine in the desert is so important with so many um, animals that are um, close to extinction there was so much desecration um, of a land that they still considered theirs to steward. And their people, there was Apache burial grounds um, that were being destroyed. And it's also important to know that there was walls built on either side of their reservation um, during the Operation Gatekeeper in 1994, and then Hold the Line also in 1993. So having walls right next to the reservation meant that all the border traffic was being funneled directly onto their reservation, creating a huge influx of people um, right onto their land. And... Um, you know, again, this is a longer story. I'm just uh, wanting to set up some of the context for how the border is affecting um, Native Americans today. And then I'll go into the history. But, um, you know, one of the things that Democrats and others have argued is that, well, um, if the actual building of the wall is so damaging uh, we should actually turn to the virtual border wall and bring in um, all of these surveillance towers, ground sensors, drones, and survey the border from, um, you know, this kind of automated perspective. But this has been also incredibly um, violent for um, the members of the Tahana Atham because these integrated fixed towers are incredibly powerful. They can see through cars and homes, and they can also, the cameras that they use are so powerful that they can see miles and miles from where they're actually located. And so you can imagine that this means that there's very little privacy on their land, and there's all kinds of infrastructures and damaging rays that, um, uh, you know, cover their land and um, the people that live at the border. Okay. Um, so as I was, um, you know, embarking on this project, I had to sort of, um, you know, think about how was I going to tell the story about how the border had become so militarized. And I decided that um, I would start by um, actually trying to follow the surveillance technologies themselves. So, you know, how is it that the drone was built? When was it first built? When was it first imagined? And maybe that could help me understand the history of the border in a new way. And so this really comes out of the field of science and technology studies, you know, and really thinking centrally about how technology reshapes what it means to be human and um, the new kinds of inequalities that um, come out of it. So um, this question about, you know, when and where were the drones actually being developed took me to um, Fort Huachuca which is a military fort that was set up after the Civil War to control the fugitive Chiricahua, Apache, and others 
that were crossing the Huachuca Mountains and escaping into Mexico to flee capture by the Calvary Army, who were hoping uh, to border or incarcerate them onto reservations so that they could take control of the Western frontier and especially um, the border. Um, and it, this mountain called Huachuca is known as Thunder Mountain, and it's long been sacred to the Apache and many others who understand the power of this ancestor to bring life, rain, nutrients, protection um, to the people and the region. Okay, so um, when I first arrived at Huachuca and the fort, Fort Huachuca, I noticed that there was this bronze statue that was situated between two of the museums there. One was the Indian War Museum and the other one was the U.S. Army Intelligence Museum. And so this was a monument um, built in, I think, 1995 that orients visitors on how to interpret you know, these historical connections between the Indian scouts from the 1960s and 70s and the high-tech drones that are being deployed on the border today. So it was fascinating to see um, in the records and the archives at the actual museums that the Indian scout was literally called the eyes of the army, right? The eyes of the cavalry army, similar to the drones that are today called the eyes of the army. And these drones that were displayed in the museum there had names such as Apache, Icona, which means intelligence, Hunter, Blackhawk, et cetera, right? So the Indian scout, right, that's positioned below the cavalry officer, um, it's, it's very interesting to see that the cavalry officer is actually holding binoculars, right? And I found one of the stories that matched this actual monument that talked about one of the officers um, saying that while he had good planes eyes, right, the ability to see across the plane, that he wasn't able to see even with his binoculars, right? As well as the Indian scouts whose eyes were so much more superior at identifying humans, animals, and objects far out in the distance. So this was many one of many of the stories I found in the archives that didn't match the history books that had been written during the 1980s and 90s that tried to prove that the frontier was won over um, because of the superior technological might of the West over, quote, the primitive Indian braves. So here's one of the quotes from um, one of the history books that I found that says, uh, the Huachuca Post story is one of savage context of arms between dedicated and able frontier army soldiers and implacable Indian braves, a confrontation which culminated in the inevitable reduction of the primitive by the technologically advanced. So this story then um, I thought about as, you know, thinking about how evolution is so tied to technological development. So I kind of coined this term techno-evolution to think about this long evolutionary story that naturalizes sort of the dying off of the primitive Indian and their knowledge by those that were more technologically advanced, so the white settlers. Um, so military historians actually describe Apache warriors as being able to travel and communicate across great distances without being detected which is incredibly similar to how drones are talked about. So I'm arguing here that um, Apache uh, tracking intelligence is not just prior to the development of drones, but actually foundational. That knowledge was foundational to how remote technologies 
continue to be developed at borders around the world. So many of the different chapters take on different technologies and tie it back to indigenous sacred science. Um, and of course, the Calvary Army completely misunderstood, right, how it was that Apache scouts could see better than their own technological tools. Um, so in this chapter, I was examining the archival, oops, sorry, the archival collections and educational displays that were held in these two museums to consider how and why the U.S. Army wanted to both showcase Indian scouts as these technological extensions of military intelligence and surveillance. And despite Indian scouts ability to code or to communicate information across long distances, native intelligence remains contained within the historical archive as a primitive skill, right? These are just their anatomical natural eyes. But in fact, some of the top lieutenants of a new field that they created um, during the time of the Indian Wars, it, this field was called military intelligence, showed um, all of these different lieutenants studying and documenting very closely the ways that Chiricahua Apaches moved and communicated, again, very stealthily across miles of desert and mountainous terrain without being seen or heard. So these knowledges developed over centuries um, of knowledge with the land and became appropriated into the Calvary's arsenal of military technologies as a technology, right? These um, anatomical or natural eyes that were sort of the predated technology of their high-tech technological vision within drones. So that there's an alienation of, you know, this kind of um, extraction of native intelligence that really um, misunderstood the deep sacred knowledge that the Apache and many other native peoples had with the land. Uh, which showed their deep belonging with the land. Um, so for example, in that image of um, the native scout crouching down um, below the Calvary Army officer, it's easy to miss that um, the scout is actually using gestural code, right? He's pointing two fingers out uh, into the distance. And um, for many American Indians at this time, gestures were actually a superior language used to express a world in constant motion to others across a vast distance. So signing with two fingers pointed to a person out in the distance rather than an animal, for instance, um, by referring to their dual female and male identity. Let me go to the next slide here. Um, so it's important to sort of contextualize, however, how their knowledge continued to be cast as primitive. So at the time, you know, in the mid to uh, later 1800s, this is when Charles Darwin creates his knowledge of um, evolution in 1856. And many others were very much influenced by this idea of how time progressed through this idea that we moved from primitive to more sophisticated um, technologies and also uh, humans. So. I just wanted to point out the work by the anthropologist Lewis Henry Morgan, who wrote a book called Ancient Society in 1877. And he said that human intelligence could be measured by um, the impact that their, oh my goodness, I'm having a hard time reading my own screen here. Um, so that human intelligence could be measured by the impact their innovative objects have on society. And so he made the argument that there was in fact these three stages of human evolution and intelligence, 
right? The earliest time when humans made the most simple tools he called savagery, and this was referring to Indians. Then he said that there's this in-between um, moment in time when there was more effective um, and slightly more um, inventive tools that he called barbaric. And then you have, of course, the highest state of time, which was associated with civilization, when he said, quote, um, you know, this was the white man's tools that became the highest state of civilization. And uh, one of his quotes really um, exemplifies the role of intelligence and settlement. So he says, with the production of inventions and discoveries, and with the growth of institutions, the human mind necessarily grew and expanded. And we are led to recognize a gradual enlargement of the brain itself, particularly of the cerebral portion. Right. So a lot of these studies were being used to demonstrate that the more sophisticated tools humans made, the more intelligent they were, and that we could see this as a story that told of this progressive story of time and history, which really contributed to, again, the ways in which um, there would be this inevitable replacement of primitive technologies and primitive peoples that would be replaced by the civilized. Um, so this story, right, is um, so important to the ways in which the theft of land um, happened across the frontiers, the Western frontier, and also along the border. Um, okay, so let me move here. Um, and this is all rel relevant to um, the fact that, you know, Native peoples also used gestural codes um, because, um, you know, this idea of civilization was also tied to language. And so there were also theories about the evolution of language that said, you know, that there was these early gestural languages to um, the most modern use of um, written language in particular. Um, and so it was fascinating to, for me to see in the archives that there were military officers. Some of them had recently retired after the Civil War ended that draw, drew upon Charles Darwin's theory of evolution to say that, you know, gesture language it was this ancient form of communication by, quote, the low tribes of man and closer to communication of animals such as apes, as well as those with disabilities or those who were mentally ill. So gestures then were seen as less evolved than speech and written communication, but at the same time, they were also so fascinated with Indian gestural codes, um, which led many of them to study this, quote, primitive form of communication as an avenue to unlock the mystery of ancient humans. And of course, you know, ironically, there were so many native tribes, including the Cherokee, that have actually a much more had a much more complex written alphabet. Um, and you know, many native people saw their own communication technologies as superior to, or at least on par with, the white men. And this included Iron Hawk of the Sioux, who said, "Quote, he." meaning the great spirit gave us the power to talk with our hands and arms and send information with the mirror, blanket and pony far away. And when we meet with Indians who have a different spoken language from ours, we can talk to them in signs. There were also a few ethnologists such as Garrick Mallory, who actually stated in his address for the American Association for the Development of Science in 1881, that quote, with gesture, he could exhibit actions, motions, positions, forms, dimensions, directions, and distances in much more complexity than language. And there were many others who also described gestural code as poetry in motion that was developed 
through this necessity um, for commerce with other tribes across great distances, you know, sort of a, a, a globalizing language that many people could communicate through and was also used um, by hunters closing in on their prey and, of course, um, in the context of war. So one of the, oops, let me make sure. Okay. So Arthur um, Wagner was one of these military um, officers who wrote several books um, describing the art of military um, intelligence. And, you know, as we know, uh, gestural codes have long been a coveted technique of war. Um, many of you probably have heard of native code talkers during World War I and II where hundreds of Native Americans from over 20 tribes um, use languages, right? Their own languages to send secret or coded messages that were in fact never decoded. Um, so in a similar way, it was interesting to see um, Arthur Wagner uh, write about his close study of Native Americans' ability to communicate and move silently across large distances, which again, were part of what I'm calling sacred scientific knowledge that inspired automated surveillance today. Um, yet rather than seeing from above, Apache and Sioux scouts were able to maneuver undetected on the ground. So there was countless archival records that described Apache, Sioux, and other tribes as being able to sort of melt um, into the mountains, trees, or rocks, or use the terrain to hide and move invisibly across the land by hiding into the shadow of a rock or moving behind the cover of a bush. And so one of the quotes from Wagner's book um, says, it should be observed that these Indians are all trained for war and that their methods come of constant practice and of a study which is not less deep because it is unlettered. Constant practice in hunting, stalking game, and making long journeys through wild country makes the Indians experts in judging distances, reconnoitering, utilizing cover, and husbanding the strength of themselves and their horses. So he also um, naturalized this idea that all Indian peoples were bred to be warriors. So I wanted to tell um, a brief story about um, Geronimo, who was also um, part of a band of um, Chiricahua Apaches who had escaped um, the Calvary and used the mountains to um, cross into Mexico. But he, um, you know, in checking with other sources from, you know, Apache based sources, Geronimo is not talked about necessarily just as a warrior, but as a shaman who, quote, was said to have the power of the coyote as he could appear here, then suddenly over there, he could outfox anybody. The soldier passed right by him, end of quote. So it's interesting to think about why the soldiers couldn't see him. Um, in some ways, it was because they he could move beyond the limit of human vision by transforming himself into the form of an animal or a bush, you know, to to move as a bush would or to understand what time of day would open up just a slice of shade angled between two jutting rocks that he could hide in between. Um, so this ability of shamans to enter into other forms um, and to learn the spirit, right? This, this science of learning the spirit of animals was, was part of the sacred science of learning again, how the stars and seasons shaped um, the migration and movement of animals, altered the water levels uh, of uh, and sources of water, 
right? Taught humans how to commune with animals that they hunted, to have this relationship with them, to know which animals and plants they, they had to leave behind. So to study the, the motions of life and dreams and visions and everyday life was part of this deep scientific study in which you couldn't separate oneself from what you studied, whether an animal, the wind, the rocks, right? That are, are all part of the living world in these interconnected um, relations. So these deep knowledges were passed down given of course, how critical it was to learn animal migration patterns, you know, where to find food, where to find water in the desert, which plants to avoid, and which could be used for different medicines. So while seen as a warrior, Geronimo was a shaman whose entire family was actually killed in front of him, when, uh, which of course transformed him into a warrior overnight. Um, okay, time check. I'm getting close here. Um, uh, I just wanted to really quickly mention that, you know, some of the, some of these knowledges continue at the border as migrants use carpet on the bottom of their shoes so that they can't be tracked, or even in the context of war in Afghanistan and Iran, where people use um, heat blankets and lay down on rocks so that the drones can't actually um, see them. Um, so I, I think I'm gonna wrap up and um, conclude by saying that, um, you know, this, this techno-scientific war at the border continues to threaten indigenous people's way of life, especially um, their sacred ties to land. And um, the border has been weaponized on their land, threatens to destroy their ability to exist um, and to be able to exist in ways where they're able to practice ceremony, ways of living that respect their responsibility to protect the land, protect the people on their land, their ancestors, and to refuse the carceral logic of borders, national security, and even the logic of conservation when it means they're pushed off of that land. So to see the border through techno-scientific threats, whether binoculars or drone sensing, narrows the field of vision to a target, like a weapon, and erases the context of genocide against indigenous peoples and their displacement from their land. By the end of the 19th century, the Apache had lost untold numbers of lives and six million acres of land. And despite this loss, um, the Apache and the Tan Atham and many others persist in maintaining ties with their homelands across borders, which have been occupied since the Indian Wars. So in the book, I aim to replace this violence by uncovering indigenous sacred sciences, the knowledges they learn from ancestors that continue to render borders meaningless, a remapping of place that holds deep knowledges that can help save um, our earth. Seeing the border through the lens of technological threat doesn't see the very sacred scientific knowledges that hold the key to preserving our world today by learning how to be in relation with land through movement, moving with the seasons, animals, and plants to preserve the land so it continues to abundantly produce its gifts for all of us long into the future. Thank you. Do you want me to stop sharing? Um, that is up to you. It's a nice sort of summary of, of your talk. Um, so you can move it up or you can take it, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just stop so I can see everyone. All right, sounds good. Thank you so, so much for, um, for your presentation. Um, we're waiting for some questions uh, to come in, it looks like, but... Um, so uh, I guess a question um, that I have is sort of, you know, we talk a lot about this, the, there's like these buzzwords out there now, like indigenous science and traditional ecological knowledge. And um, they're both buzzwords, but then also not buzzwords because they do have um, real meaning. Um, do you see a, uh, 
a nuanced or like sort of like vast difference between the term sacred science and indigenous knowledge? Yeah, that's a really good question. I thought a lot about that because I didn't want this to like, you know, I'm, I didn't want this to replace any other ways in which talking about, you know, indigenous knowledge. Um, and especially, you know, I know a lot of people use traditional ecological knowledge or TEK. The word traditional, I think, just has had, um, you know, it's it's also this question of who we're talking to, right? And I really wanted this to be a story that could hit sort of those who really hold Western science to a high level and to really um, say that this is this is ancestral traditional knowledge, but it's knowledge that is based on such a deep scientific practice. So I tried to follow a lot of other indigenous scholars who really wanted to say that native peoples do science and it's better science because it brings together the knowledge of communities over millennial, you know, over, so much time and that it and that it's very specific to a place and to a people. And so you can't abstract a knowledge in one place and take it somewhere else, right? I think Western sciences really relies on this idea that you can create an idea, a theory, a method, and it can be used anywhere. Right. And this is, um, yeah. So being very careful to, um, both say that it's based on a sacred relation and a deep knowledge that we've lost, but um, really trying to put it above or at least on par uh, with Western science. You know, I think that, you know, one thing too is when you, when, when we say the word sacred, you know, sacred also has a different meaning in other ways that the way that people interpret sacred, you know, like you know, when we're talking like sacred knowledge, you know, or we're talking about like a sacred object, you know, so even when we're looking at that word sacred, we need to, you know, think about how, how that, um, how people would interpret it, you know, because then people are like, think about that word, think, oh, you know, kind of thing. And then the other part is for us, it's, you know, it is that deeper knowledge, therefore it's sacred for us, mm -hmm. you know, as, as indigenous people to be able to, you know, to, to know that, but, you know, part of it is that, that, you know, as we're, you know, like indigenizing or decolonizing, you know, those words mean different um, things to other people, that you know we have to really think about that and, and really what what we're trying to say and get get across to people because sometimes I think some people stop at that word and you know because it means something different to them you know in another yeah. Few mm -hmm. yeah I appreciate that um and you know I knew that um there's definitely stories I'm not telling in the book um there's knowledges that only certain people can tell there's knowledges that only you can only tell at certain times of the year or you know under a certain uh constellation of stars so yeah it's it's tricky to use that term um in a big public way um I mean I was wanting to connect it to uh, a scientific practice of so many different people um, in order to say, you know, because I do think this is a time where we have to listen to Indigenous people. I really think those are the knowledges that are going to um, help us out of this problem that you know, the West, Western ways of thinking have gotten us into the way that we've destroyed the earth and continue to do that. And so it is sacred. And, um, you know, and I had to think about my own role in this whole process of telling this story. Um, and I'm just one of many others, you know, I'm learning with the people that brought me into this project. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it it's definitely a process. And it's, you know, I think that's the other part too. When, when we're you know looking at 
you know, talking about some of the words and, and the meanings of them, but, and, and working, you know, looking at the way that Western science is versus indigenous knowledge. And, you know, they're, they're, they're all sciences. And then we're all trying to figure out, you know, it's not us against them. It's like, how are we working together? How can, how can we figure this out? You know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. not one is better than the other. It's just, how are we going to figure it out together? to work together and, and, and have that understanding, you know, on both sides. Yeah, exactly. And, but there's deep worldviews that are nestled into those different approaches. And that's what has been so underappreciated yes. that I really wanted to bring out. Yes. Great. I think there are a couple of questions in here, Rebecca. Yeah, we've got a couple here. Um, the first, uh, um uh the person asks to what extent might moving into mexico to avoid um the the military um of of any form work out well for any indigenous person who might have been living along the border um well you know today uh, a lot of the you know as i showed on that map a lot of the land crosses into Mexico. So, you know, you're still on indigenous land. Um, and back then it was tricky because, you know, you also had the, the Northern territory of Mexico, which was um, unsurveyed or, you know, the government really couldn't extend its role in controlling that territory. So it was a space that indigenous people could flee to in a way that is different from today. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm a little bit distracted because my laptop is saying that I'm running out of battery and I do not wanna crash my laptop, but I think I left it. Um, maybe as you're just, well, Hopefully it'll last. That's, you know, we're almost it's, it's out okay. of town. Almost out of town. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's perfect timing. Um, okay. We have about a minute left, and so um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can reach out to us here at Crow Canyon, um, or reach out directly to Felicity um, with any follow up questions. Um, since we're about five o'clock, and just thank perfect you so perfect much. Timing. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for bringing me. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.